about uh, reps into, so um, I into G, where G is finite. Right now, I just want to make two observations. The first observation is that these are extremely computable for any finitely presented group. There are only finitely many choices of where you can send the generators into G, enumerate all the possible images of the generators, and for each one, find the image of the relator. And if the relator goes to a trivial element, you have a representation. If it doesn't, you don't. So in fact, representations in a finite group have been a very important tool in making knot tables, very, very classical stuff. And Bob Wiley was someone who did a lot of these, these tabulations early on in the history of computational knot theory. Um, and the other observation, talking about transformation groups, um, without loss of generality, you can think of G as a group of permutation matrices. Since G acts on itself by permutation. Okay. So the next collection I want to talk about is Menabelian representations. And I'll give you a reference here. I'm mostly going to be talking about work of H. Oops, sorry. And Stefan Friedel, and this is Metabelian uh, reps, Metabelian uh, SL2 state reps. H1 and multiply by H2. 
Now, if you want to be a little less formal about this, you can just think of it this way, that every element in the semi-direct product, you can basically take the commas out and say that each element here has a unique representation with an element of g multiplied on the right by an element of h. And then if you want to com commute the g2, the g element past the h element, then you just have to do, you have to apply this phi, oh, sorry, phi of g2 to h1. So a familiar example is the dihedral group if we think of tau as being a single flip and a power of alpha as a rotation flip and rotation. And we want to multiply by, so this could be tau to, to the 0 or tau to the 1, but let's take the particular case where you have a tau here, alpha to the k. Tau is going to correspond to sending j to minus j if you want to pull this past in the tau alpha. Or you pull the tau's past, so I'm sorry, you get tau squared, which is the identity, and then alpha to the j minus k. I'm going to do that a little more formally coming up. But so the first example. Can you go back for a second? Yeah. Do you have pi double prime above this definition? Uh, yes, yeah, so the commutator of the commutator? Of pi. Of pi. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so as I said, this is going to turn out to be a semi-direct product, and the way that works, I've gotten past my page. Uh, where are we? Okay. So, consider a short. Exactly. Sequence as follows. One goes into pi prime mod pi double prime goes to the thing we're interested. Pi mod pi double prime goes to um, pi mod pi prime goes to one. Think about that in a minute. Okay. This. Pi mod pi prime, we just noticed, is isomorphic to z. Since that's abelian, this thing actually splits. And this is part of the general theory of these semi-direct products. This means that the term in the middle, pi mod pi double prime, is isomorphic to a semi-direct product, z acting on prime mod pi double prime. Um, let, let me do it in two terms. So this is, uh, let me first write it this way. It's semi-direct direct product pi prime mod pi. I've got it backwards. Pi mod pi prime. OK. So this was isomorphic to z. And this one, of course, is the abelianization of the commutator subgroup that's just each. And, and here, the, the maps and the exact sequence determine the automorphism that you get in the symmetry yeah. product. And so what's it going to be? In fact, um, Z acts on Let's just call this thing H for short. Z acts on H by multiplication. Um, let's see. So, um, so N goes to multiplication. And the isomorphism then is given by some G over in here. Um, so maybe I should call it g plus pi double prime is sent to is sent to an in integer. That integer is going to be this epsilon of g. 
right? That's what sends the knot loop into, into C. And then over here, we'll have A, where A is just an image of something in the kernel. So it's the A is uh, the image of x to the minus epsilon g times g, where x is the so this is one way. We pick one thing, we fix one thing in the kernel here, and then if you multiply by an appropriate power of x, then you get something that's in the commutator subfield. And so this is this is something in high prime, but now I'm really thinking of it's a billionization in H1. It's image in H1. So this, this gives us something, oh, sorry, this one is in high prime, and so this is just in a general organization in, in our H. Just call it H for sure. So let's just be a little more concrete here. Suppose our pi has, for instance, a Beardinger where um, Presentation x naught, x one, x m meridians. It doesn't have to be any special thing. Some if these are meridians, we'll just fix x equal to one of the meridians, and x i is a i times x, where a i is in pi prime, and then. A little abuse of notation. I'm going to think of AI as a module generator of our H1 of X1. So I'm, I'm conflating AI with its image under the billionization. And then our generator XI is going to go in the semi-direct product to the pair one is All our meridians will go to one and then commutator so we go that gets from from your fixed meridian. Other questions about that? This is just a, a handy way of looking at this. Now, I actually promised last time that I would explain um, that little computation that Dan did going from a diagram to a module presentation of, um, of this Alexander module H1 of X prime. And so we're in a good position to do that right now. Um, if you have a crossing in your diagram like this, this was xi, xj, xk. So these are the meridians. And we use this convention over here that xi is ai times x, as over there. Um, we get a relation. The, the Beardinger relator is xi, xj is xk. Xi, remember Xi just corresponds to a little circle around this fundamental group. So if I rewrite it, I have that Ai X, Aj X is uh, A K X, Ai X. I'll multiply both sides on the right by Xi to the minus 2 and turn those into inverses. And then remember that here we're, here we're in pi, um, but actually both of these things are in the commutator subgroup. So we're actually in pi prime here. And then when we go into H1 of X prime by abelianization, conjugation by X becomes multiplication by T. And so we get, using that abusive notation, AI plus TAJ is 
Dan was using the letters X, which I guess are further use of notation, but I like to use these little letters A if I want to keep this straight here. So these AIs are the particle generators, and these are the particle generations. OK, questions about that? OK. to figure out what the metabelian representations of the knot group look like. And Bowden and Friedel give a nice canonical form for them. It goes as follows. So we're looking at, um, we're looking at, for generally I'm going to look at GL2C reps first, and then we'll say which ones are SL2C. So let's let Z be a non-zero complex number, and chi is a homomorphism from H, which is, again, I'll stop writing this after a while, H1 of X prime into C star, and so this is a homomorphism. These things are usually known as characters. a special thing. I want to assume that this homomorphism factors through H mod T to the N minus 1. And all that means is that chi of T to the N times A should be the same as chi of A mod A And so when this happens, we're going to say that chi has period. And I don't, Friedel and Bowden don't use that term, um, but they do use this one, the minimal period. The minimal end for which this holds is the order So if you have two different periods, then in fact the GCD will also have to be a period. The minimal one of these is going to be the order of the final. Is it possible for Kata to have infinite order? Uh, it yeah, in general. So we're only going to be worried about the finite period. Okay. moment. No, I actually, because the image, it's not true. Since the image is a billion, it's going to actually have to be finite. Yeah, well, we'll have to be finite. Yeah, this is something I will mention briefly. Since since the image here is, is a billion, it turns out that everything will have a finite period. Okay. So, given these ingredients, a z and a chi, we obtain a representation depending on z and chi from chi into g l n c by um, so if we take so I'm going to identify this since we've got it identified as a semi-direct product of Z and H, I'll say what happens to an integer here and an A in H. This is going to go to, so basically, this represents some, some uh, this, is, this is our epsilon of G right here. So I'm going to take the following matrix, it's going to be like a cyclic permutation matrix. So 0, 0, 1, et cetera, all the way around to uh, 0, 0, 
point so here. here is, I, I think yeah. you offered that something. There can be infinite order characters uh, if you go outside the unit circle. Oh, yeah. If you're yeah, on you're the unit right. circle with non zero complex numbers, then we'll find out this. That's <coughs> Why can't you have an irrational angle in the unit circle? Uh, it, Does it doesn't it project on? I mean, if it's yeah. a fiber knot, sure. Let's see. It's sort of a fiber knot that projects on the yeah. z to the two g, and just right. take one of those factors and send it in. Yeah, I'm trying to think on my feet. So we're thinking of a, a circle of representation. Yeah. Let's talk about that. I know if you get outside the unit circle. From stretching. I mean, you must have some other stretching condition. Okay, anyhow, basically, basically our meridian x is going to go to this element. Uh, our fixed meridian x is going to go to this element. So if we have epsilon of g is j, we'll raise that to a power of j. And then here we're going to put a diagonal matrix, chi of a, chi of t a, down to chi of t to the n minus 1 a. And then we have a theorem of Friedel and Bowden, but let me first remind you what irreducible means a linear representation gamma is irreducible if no proper subspace is variant under the image So in this case, we think of this acting on C to the N, of course, if there's no proper subspace that's invariant under the images, carry it to itself under the set of images of elements. So now I'll state the, the theorem of Friedel, um, first of all, this metabelian representation we define is irreducible if and only if uh, n is actually the order uh, chi, so that n is the least possible period here. And then Secondly, all uh, every quantifier, every irreducible um, metabelian G L N C representation is one of these up to conjugacy. So it's a very nice little classification of these metabolian maps. Is that C? Uh, oh, C, sorry. Distinguished meridian is just going to be 
post this on. Off diagonal is going to be 0, 1, 1, 0, and gamma of something A in H is just going to look like chi A, chi of TA. And I claim, in fact, that chi of A is the only thing we can choose freely here. Chi of TA is going to be determined by it. And this is why. So we're assuming that our character, when we take n equals 2, we're assuming that we have chi of t squared a is chi of a. Then we have chi of t squared minus 1 a is equal to 0. I'm going to write that as t plus 1 t minus 1 a is equal to 0. And now we call something that Dan proved that t minus 1 induces a surjection on H. And so this says if we apply chi, this, this has to be true for all A and H, but in fact this says that chi of T plus 1 times A is 0 for all A and H, or chi of T A is the eraser handy because I'd like to say that this is chi of A, but let's remember that we're thinking of chi as a multiplicative character, so I have to take that away and write it as a multiplicative character. In fact, this argument works perfectly well for N. Likewise, if you had T to the N, minus 1 here, you can still factor out a t minus 1. And so, in fact, this is always going to have determinant 1 if we're going into, let's see, do we need anything here? No, I think this is nothing else we need. This is always going to be determinant 1. And so this has determinant 1 if and only if the z is minus 1 to the n plus 1. And so this tells you what the SLNC representations are also. We just need this condition of z. How do 
we compute these characters of chi into um, h, remember that's h1 of x prime, into z my peak. And some of you probably already know this story. We're talking here about fox p colorings. Does everyone know what the fox p colorings are? I guess I'll tell you now. OK, so this is a pretty classical invariant. It really shows up in an exercise in uh, Fox's paper. Is it his book? His book, in Fox's book. Shows up as an exercise in his book. So let's think about these a little. Um, I don't know. Maybe I should skip it and go on. I think I'll have to say more about these. So let me use um, Fox colorings. And if we generalize a little bit more, we get a theory of something called representation shifts. So just a little personal note, what we come up with for representations of H into a finite group here, we can define a dynamical system given by a finite directed graph, which tells us all of the representations and their periods. We can pick out the periodic ones. If G is not a billion, we will find some that are non-periodic that way too, don't have any period at all. And very nice theory. This is actually what got me into working with Dan. My background is symbolic dynamics. And what we get here are symbolic dynamical systems. And this is where our collaboration is starting to work. Interesting. And maybe next week we'll get into talking about this. OK, but I think we need some more examples for Dan. So let's go on to parabolic SL2C representations. So I think we're off on number three here.
curvature minus 1. And this is described by a discrete faithful um, to PSL to TC. And then it's a result of Thurston that this lifts to an SL to C. Yeah. How does the representation of the not group give you a metric? Unless, if you don't want to go into this, that's okay. Huh? Uh, probably not right now. Okay. okay. So these are interesting because they have something to do with these important hyperbolic structures on the uh, list, not complementary. Okay. So suppose we have one of these. Trivial, let's assume that it's non abelian. Um, then to meridians, x, y, and uh, non. The one copy of these, this page, I thought I rewrote this sign. Okay. Non commuting. Images since the meridians generate everything, and so Riley observed, maybe other people have observed this, um, that up to conjugation, conjugating everything in the image by some fixed element of SL2C, we can assume that x goes to a matrix of, excuse me, if we're using capital X, I know it's not exterior, but we've got this notation kind of handy just to have a little letter go to a matrix named by the capital letter, so maybe we'll write the x that way. So we can conjugate it so that, oops, one goes up there, again, my finger's all dirty. x goes to this triang upper triangular matrix, and y goes to a matrix, lower triangular matrix with some entry omega here. And this is some non-zero complex number. And then he goes on further to say what about where other meridians can go and there are various cases depending on which meridians commute and all of that. But if you have a knot loop generated by two meridians, this story ends here. You can conjugate it to something in this normal form, and this motivates looking at a special class of knots, which are the two bridge knots. So, definition, just to get some nice examples, we'll look at this class of two bridge knots. K is a two bridge knot if it has diagram with exactly two local maxima. So something like got X here and on a Y here and I'm about it's not worried about orientations yet. Have an x and a y, and then maybe there's some twisting going on here, and then a spin comes out here, and twist around here. Um, but you never had any other maxima. And therefore, using the Beardinger relations, you can write all the other meridians in terms of these cross relations. Okay? So 
In fact, these are a very well-studied class. They can all be described in terms of uh, rational tangles and big theory that I'm not going to go into, but just some essential facts about them. Um, to bridge knots are there are various ways to write. Indeterminate W. I think 
was a different, let's call this, since I'm going to be referring back to what we call the star. And star, and using the relation, we find that omega is a loop. capital V, which is going to depend on that pair alpha. Because it's just, it's going to depend on these, what these epsilon i's are for that particular alpha beta. So, little remark, if k alpha beta is the same mod as alpha beta prime, we may actually have different phi's phi alpha beta different from phi alpha beta prime, but they will have the same degree because in fact the degree is just going to turn out to come from the number of epsilons here, which is alpha minus one. If the degree turns out to be alpha, I got that right? Um, alpha minus one over two. Um, alpha is actually the determinant of the mod. Okay. Yeah, that's an interesting observation. Alpha turns out to be the determinant of the k. We'll have the same degree alpha minus 1 over 2. And uh, basically, you'll get two different sets if you look at all the possible roots for one polynomial and for another polynomial. You just get two different sets of representatives of the same function sequences. So it's just a, a curious thing that the polynomial is not uniquely determined. Um, so we call phi alpha beta a binary polynomial, since we only didn't give it any name. And they have various interesting properties. Some things that Riley showed. Um, these are monic. He showed that the degree is alpha minus 1 over 2. I've already written that. Uh, some of these are easy. The constant coefficient is plus and minus 1. And that means omega is, in fact, an algebraic, not just an algebraic number, but an algebraic integer. Um, and algebraic unit, okay, yeah, it's more than that, of course. So in general, it would be an algebraic integer, but in fact, we get an algebraic unit for these two bridge knots. And this is a product of distinct prime factors. And if, uh, let's call it factors, piece, little p sub i, and uh, roots are uh, the same factor to give equivalent representations. In fact, if the roots are the same irreducible factor, you actually have a Galois automorphism of z adjoining <laughs> omega to z adjoint omega prime, but in fact these are equal. You have a Galois automorphism taking this to itself, and that induces, if you follow the, remember equivalent means that you take one representation and follow it by an automorphism of your image group. You get the other one. In this case, the automorphism is this Galois automorphism. 
takes one of these here. It takes one root to the other root. And so in particular, if one of these factors, if you look at the one in the case of the hyperbolic knot, one of these is going to give the parabolic representation corresponding to the hyperbolic structure. That one will be faithful. All the others will also be faithful representations. So we're just about out of time. Um, I can give a few examples. There, there are lots of properties of these, and I've given talks about these before. So again, this is something we can get into later on. Um, what is it? Um, Let me just give an example of the knot 5, 2. It's kind of cute. I'm not very good at drawing these standing up on the blackboard, so it's here. So this is a picture of K73, which is the knot 5, 2. And if you turn it upside down, so let's see, I think these have to go, if that one in, it goes in, call this x prime, y prime. If you turn it upside down, you get the other pair, 7, 5, of integers that correspond to the same one. And we get two different polynomials. d 7, 3 is uh, w cubed plus w squared plus Two double plus one, and the seven five one is almost the same minus the w squared plus two double plus one. I think in this case the roots of one are the squares of the roots of the other, but it's, that's an interesting question when you get the same roots. Um, I mean, what, what the relationship between the roots of these are, there's always some nice relationship here. Um, if we look at the case of beta equals 1, this is simply a torus not alpha 2. That's a, the, uh, just one of these things. Uh, that's been bad. What are we doing here? I can't draw it right now. All right. So this is an alpha 2 tourist knot. And um, so we're running out of time. It turns out these satisfy a nice recursion. You can explicitly compute the Riley polynomials V alpha 1, and they also come up in some other contexts, so they're also known as Morgan voice polynomials. Uh, Riley gives an explicit factorization of these. It turns out that you can write it as a product of the, I shouldn't, I shouldn't use these, I should have used some other letter for these, like F sub D, D divides um, alpha, where the degree of f sub d is Euler's phi function of d. So I've been using too many phi's, but here, this, in this formula, this is the Euler's phi function. And this is, there's actually a prime factorization of this form. So in particular, this is irreducible if alpha is prime. So I can give you at least one question um, that's open, as far as I know, is the alpha beta always irreducible when alpha is one. We know it's true when beta is one, and it's true if alpha is less than 100. We calculate this. So that's my first question. Um, I 
maybe I'll, I'll stop here and not talk about total reps because I don't have anything to say about them. So, it's a good place to stop. Thanks. Any questions? Yes. Towards the, <coughs> towards the end, you had um, properties of this Riley polynomial. Yeah. Are, do any of the, the properties hold when you talk about more general classes or not? I mean, you were talking about just specific. Well, let's just question what the Wiley polynomial should be. Um, so in this case, um, so where this came from, remember, is that we're sending x to uh, 1, 1, 0, 1, and y to 1, 0, omega 1. And then we only have one relator to satisfy wx is yw, where these are words of x and y. And so all the possible omegas are roots of a single polynomial. In fact, if you take the image, um, if you take gamma of this word capital W, then if you look at the 1, 1 entry of this, that turns out to be P of alpha omega. So, what, what would a Wiley polynomial mean if you have more generators? Is, I don't think in general there's a single polynomial whose roots will, will determine the possible omega switch. Yes? You mentioned the two-bridge the thing. Oh, yeah, this, this is another question. So there's actually no reason to just look at two-bridge knots. We can look at two-bridge links. And the relation for those, curiously enough, turns out to look like this. Is it? Yeah. Okay. So there's, there's something very similar there. And so you can define Wiley polynomials for links. And we're trying to figure out what the pattern is with the constant coefficient of these. It's not necessarily plus or minus 1, as it is for the knots. And as a matter of fact, it seems in many examples, it turns out to be the algebraic linking number. Um, I think the we haven't done a huge exhaustive search. This is something we happen to notice in, in a relatively small number of examples. If the algebraic linking number is 0, well, we have one example where it turns out to be the geometric number. And so this, this is a curious case. So can we say anything about the constant coefficient of the that's, that's a question we don't know the answer to. We haven't, we haven't done any huge amount of computation on this. I think for the torus links, it does turn out, the constant coefficient does turn out to be one. It's, it's easy to find those also by a reference condition. Okay, anything else? Thanks again.